All of us at one time or another have misplaced something of value to us. You ever misplaced anything of value to you? Maybe your glasses like gay. Maybe, maybe your car keys. Anybody lose your car keys? Maybe your wallet. Anybody ever lose your kids? Anybody ever lose your kids? Now, now you laugh about that, but there's been a time or two in our life where Vicki and I have misplaced our kids and we didn't know where we put them. And uh, we panicked a little bit and we searched and searched until we found them. Whatever it was, when you lost something, you desperately searched for it and you searched for it until you found that which was lost. Television has magnified and mystified, as it were, the fear of being lost into several adventure series. How many of you remember Gilligan's Island? Remember Gilligan's Island? A three-hour tour turned into a three-year television series. They were lost for three years. Anybody ever, I know I'm dating myself a little bit, anybody remember, I'll put a picture up, anybody remember Lost in Space? Ah, oh. now some of the younger generation sitting back thinking, lost in space, what in the world? That was from 1964 to 1968, and so uh, unless you get some old reruns, you're not familiar with that. Here's a more modern one. How many remember the television show Lost? There you, boy, I didn't get the response I thought I was going to get. Lost is one of the most watched television shows of all time, a jet traveling from Sydney, Australia to Los Angeles crashes and the passengers are stranded on a deserted island. They are lost until they are found. And if you watch the end of it, don't watch it. I think it ended goofy. And so uh, anyways, lost. And of course, when we mention all of that, we cannot help but mention the Malaysian jetliner, flight number 370, that is currently lost. Well, in today's passage of Scripture, we find Jesus talking about those that are lost. And not only talking about those that are lost, but talking about his desire to find them. Because just as you desperately desire to find your keys or your wallet or your children that are lost, Jesus desperately desires to find those that are spiritually lost. That's the context of the passage that we're studying today. And so if you have your Bibles, once again, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. We're going to study the entire chapter today. And so once again, we always put the verses up on the screen, but we want to challenge you to bring your Bible and follow along. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to begin just in the first two verses. Luke 15, 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and the religious, or the teachers of religious law, complain, criticize Jesus, that he was associating with sinful people. Can you imagine? Even eating with them. Would you bow your head and pray with me today? Father, I thank you for the uh, time of worship that we've had, for the time of fellowship. Father, we often say that Sunday morning is often like a reunion here. It's, we've gone about our everyday, somewhat, sometimes stressful lives during the week. And on Sunday, we come together as a family. And we're able to enjoy one another's presence and company and fellowship and even more importantly, we're able to enjoy your fellowship. And so, Lord, today as we look at uh, what is for some of us a familiar passage of Scripture, for others of us maybe a new passage of Scripture, I pray that you would enlighten us. I pray, first of all, Lord, if there's somebody here today that is lost, Lord, that this morning they would be found. That this morning they would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And Lord, secondly, I pray that you would help us to examine our attitude 
Help us not to have the attitude of the Pharisees here in this passage, but God, I pray that you'd help us to have the attitude, yes, help us to have the heart of Jesus. May we be like Jesus, not only today, but all throughout the week. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're in the middle of a study of the book of Luke that we've simply titled, Investigating Jesus. And the purpose of this study is for us to get to know Jesus better, not only intellectually, but that our faith might grow, and as we get to know Him, that we would grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we've already taken the time as we've walked through this book, and we've seen that Jesus is who He claims to be, none other than the very Son of God, God in the flesh. And in recent weeks, we've been studying his message. And uh, to a certain degree, he, he calls us out. He challenges us not to be just mere listeners of his message, but he challenges us to be followers of him. In order to be followers of him, as we saw several weeks ago, it's important for us to pick up our cross daily and to follow him. It's important for us to, in our minds, renounce everything that we have so that we might be his disciple. In today's passage, Jesus talks about our attitude. Not necessarily our attitude towards him, but Jesus talks about our attitude toward others. And not necessarily the people that we like and the people that we associate with and the people that we admire. But Jesus talks about our attitude towards those that we would consider the outcasts of society. Those that we might have a tendency to judge and condemn. Jesus warns us of our attitude towards those people. As you read through and you study this chapter, this chapter consists of three parables. You're familiar with them. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable as we refer to it, and we'll talk about it, the parable of the prodigal son. All three of these parables have one basic theme, the reckless love of God for people that are lost. And you might sit back and say, wow, Brian, reckless. That's kind of a a strong word, is it not? I believe you'll see it in the passage that God loves us. God loves everyone with what we would consider a reckless abandonment. God loves everyone. The second thing that we see, and you saw it in the first verses that we read, that Jesus, in contrast to the Pharisees, enjoyed spending time with tax collectors and sinners. As a matter of fact, we read the New Living Translation said this once again, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus. The NIV says it this way, now tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, the idea is not that they would just sit out in the crowd and they would hear him, but the idea is that Jesus associated with them. The the idea in the verb is this, that, that he spent time with them. So much so that the New Living Translation says this, why he even ate with them. Wow, can you imagine Jesus eating with tax collectors? Now in our day and age, you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, what's wrong with working for the IRS, all right? Tax collectors were some of the most despised members of society. They were treated as traitors to the Jewish people. They were dishonest. They were contemptible. People despised them. And yet Jesus spent time with them. And the passage also says that he spent time with notorious sinners. Why? Jesus had the audacity to spend time with prostitutes and uh, alcoholics and people that, that society would criticize and condemn. Notice the response of the Pharisees 
who were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they complained. The word complained has the idea of muttering. It has the idea of murmuring. As Jesus was meeting with these tax collectors and notorious sinners, the the Pharisees were in the background whispering to one another murmuring to one another, gossiping with one another, criticizing Jesus. Why can you believe that Jesus spends so much time with these wicked people? It seems like he ignores us who are the religious one and he spends time with all of them. Why? I never. You would have heard people making conversations like that. Well, these parables that we're going to study this morning are in response to the unloving attitude of the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees were only acting upon their erroneous beliefs. You say, Brian, what do you mean? Well, the Pharisees had two erroneous beliefs. First of all, the Pharisees believed that God loved the righteous and he hated sinners. That was convenient for them because they considered themselves righteous. And in their minds, God loved them and God hated all the wicked sinners of society. And so they somewhat put themselves up on a pedestal thinking God loves us, but God hates everyone else. And if that weren't enough, they believed, and you can read this in your documents, they believed that God, or in their documents, they believed that God delighted in sending a wicked person to hell imagine that in their minds and hearts they believe that whenever a person a sinner died and went to hell that there was joy in the presence of heaven that heaven rejoiced because one more sinner got what he or she deserved wow those are strong beliefs Yet that, those were the beliefs of the Pharisees. And so, as we read these parables this morning, there's a question that leaps from these verses and from these words. The question very simply is this. Are you more like Jesus, or are you more like the religious elite of Jesus' day? Do you love on? Do you embrace those that society rejects? Or do you stand back as a religious critic saying, you know what, those people are just getting what they deserve. Are you like Jesus? Or are you like the Pharisees? There are several truths that we can learn from these parables today. Would you follow along as we read them and study them this morning? The first parable is found in verse 3, and goes through verse 7. It's known as the parable of the lost sheep. It's a parable in which Jesus perfectly demonstrates man's condition, the fact that man is naturally lost. Notice verse 3. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost? You might want to underline how many times you see the word lost in the passage. The one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Here we find a a shepherd that has 100 sheep in his flock, 100 sheep in his fold. Now that might seem like a small flock to you, but it was a daunting task for one shepherd to keep track of 100 sheep. Well, as you can imagine, one of those sheep gets lost. How does the shepherd respond? Does Does the shepherd sit back and say, ah, no big deal. Still got 99 of my sheep. 99% of the original investment I had, I still have. No big deal. What's one lost sheep? 
that how the shepherd responds? No siree. The text says that he leaves the 90 and 9 sheep in the sheep hole fold and goes out and searches for the one that is lost. Now think with me this morning is, as you can imagine, Jesus is really not talking about sheep in this passage. He's not exhorting shepherds of sheep to pay attention and to count to make sure that every sheep is there safely tucked in for the night in the sheepfold. No, Jesus is talking about men. Jesus is talking about women. Jesus is talking about you and me. Here's what Jesus says about us. Here's what Jesus says about man. Notice the first thing that I wrote down is this. Jesus says that like sheep, man has no sense of direction. Like sheep, man has no sense of direction. If you know much about a sheep, a sheep gets lost very, very easily. As we'll see in the passage in just a few moments, a sheep needs a shepherd. Without a shepherd, a sheep gets lost because he has no sense of direction. Isaiah refers to that in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. When Isaiah says, all we like sheep have strayed away. We have, we have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the iniquity or the sins of us all. You see, here's what Jesus says. Like a sheep, man has no sense of direction. Now, ladies, you might be sitting back this morning thinking, you ain't telling me nothing I don't know. My husband has no sense of direction at all. Not only does he have no sense of direction, but he doesn't want to ask for directions. He's frequently lost. Well, believe it or not, he's not talking about driving in a car and getting lost. And the exhortation is not that we get a GPS or that we stop and ask for physical directions. Obviously, Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms. And Jesus is saying that if you leave a man or a woman on their own, they have no sense of spiritual direction. Even though they think they can figure it out, even though they think they're going the right direction, they're what? They're really lost. It makes a second application. Like sheep, man is in spiritual danger. Like sheep, man is in spiritual danger. Sheep are often the target of wild animals, lions and bears and other kinds of, uh, of animals. Uh, these animals often hunted for sheep. Sheep were an easy meal. They had nothing to protect themselves. Thus, a lone sheep was in extreme danger. That's why the shepherd left the 99 and went and looked for the one because that one sheep was in extreme danger. Here's the application, you get it. The individual who ventures out on his own without the protection of a shepherd is in real danger. Hey, hey church, that's why we say so often that, that it's so important to be a part of a congregation. It's so important to be a part of a flock because when we find ourselves all alone, though we do not realize it, we are in extreme spiritual danger. That's what Jesus is picturing here in the passage. The third thing that I wrote down is this. Like sheep, man is in desperate need of a shepherd. Like sheep, man is in desperate need of a shepherd. Sheep are animals that are much different from other animals. Every other kind of animal can exist in the wild. They're wild horses, wild goats, wild pigs, wild cats, wild dogs, but very rarely will you find a wild sheep. Why? A sheep has no sense of direction, no way to protect itself. What does a sheep need? A sheep needs a shepherd. And so here in this very first parable, Jesus exemplifies man's condition and Jesus demonstrates that a man, that a woman, without Jesus Christ, is lost. They're completely lost. They need a shepherd. And by the way, who is the shepherd? 
Jesus is the shepherd. John chapter 10, two times in that great chapter, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. As the good shepherd, Jesus persistently looks for the lost sheep until the lost are found. That persistence that God demonstrates to seek and find those that are his is repeated in the second parable. So in the first parable, the parable of the lost sheep, we find man's condition, man is naturally lost. But in the second parable, we find the fact that Jesus is compassionately searching. Notice verse 8. We jump to the second parable. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp, sweep the entire house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost coin. For some reason, I've always related to this parable. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that I lose my keys every day of my life. And as I, as I read this lady and she's turning over couch cushions and she's looking under rugs and as gay was, she's running around the house saying, can you find my glasses? Vicki can attest to the fact that I do that on a regular basis looking for my keys. Vicki, have you seen my keys? Where are they? And I never really realize that I don't have them until it's time to go, which makes it all the more frantic. Can you sense how frantic this lady is in this parable? Now, the 10 silver coins here are not just 10 silver coins. That would be bad enough to lose 10 coins. These were, ordin these were no ordinary coins. Many believe that these coins were a part of her wedding headdress or maybe a part of her dowry. These were very important coins. She lost something of extreme value. Let me ask you this morning, what is the most valuable thing that you have ever lost? I imagine we could tell some stories this morning of some valuable things that we have lost well, if this lady in the parable is one thing, she's persistent. The text says this, that she looks and she looks and she looks. Why? She turns the house upside down. She sweeps. She does everything looking for those coins. And she looks and looks until she finds them. Now, the story ends positively. She finds the lost coins. What are the applications that you and I can make? Let's try to personalize it this morning. What are some applications that we can make from this story to our lives? Here's what I wrote down. The first is this. Like the coin, a person without Jesus Christ is oblivious to the fact that he or she is lost. Catch that again. The person without Christ is oblivious to the fact that they're lost. I, I often joke that coin had no idea that it was lost. The coin wasn't over in the corner saying, help, here I am, help, find me, oh no, I'm lost. The coin had no idea it was lost. The coin is just as happy lost as it is found. The coin is oblivious to the fact that it is lost. I know that sounds goofy. But in the same way, the person without Jesus Christ has no idea that they are lost. They have no idea that they are heading in the wrong direction. They have no idea to the precariousness of their spiritual position. They're lost and they don't know it. Last week we had a tremendous missions conference here and I'm, I'm so grateful for the missionaries that were here and the missionaries that we have around the world that represent us that take the gospel of Jesus Christ to people uh, that are lost and we're reminded that there's people without Christ in Southeast Asia we're reminded there's people without Christ in Brazil we're reminded there's people without Christ in Latin America what a great job our missionaries did of reminding us of that but let me remind you of the fact that there's people that are lost in your neighborhood there's people that are lost in your workplace there are people that are lost 
in your family. And they do not know that they're lost, much like the coin. The second thing that I wrote down is this, like the coin, the person without Christ can never find himself. Think about that this morning. The person without Christ can never find itself. It's not like if the lady would have given the coin enough time that the coin would have came back to her wallet. The coin would have found its way home. No, the coin had no idea that it was lost. And the coin would have never found itself. You say, Brian, what does that mean? How does that apply? Listen, catch this this morning. Catch this. Salvation does not begin with us. A lost man doesn't wake up one morning and say, oh my word, I'm heading in the wrong direction. That rarely happens. A person has no idea that they're lost. Let's not be mistaken into thinking that we find Jesus. A few years ago, remember, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but probably 10 or 20 years ago, remember those bumper stickers that people put on their cars that supposedly when they came to Christ, they used that phrase, I found it. Do you remember that? I found it as if they were on this great search and God was playing hide and seek with them and they were able to find God. Listen, you don't find God. God finds you. You're lost. You're dead in your sins. And God is the one who finds you. Here's Jesus' words in John chapter 6 and verse 44. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Like the coin. If you're here without Jesus Christ, you're lost. And you cannot save yourself. Here's the third thing I wrote down. The third thing is this. Like the lady, Jesus searches until he finds us. And the lady searched and searched. She swept her house. She turned it upside down. Jesus searches and searches until he finds us. Hey, church, aren't you glad this morning that Jesus didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad this morning that the first time you heard the gospel and didn't respond to it, God's like, that's it. <laughs> I gave him one chance. That's it. No, God searched for you. And Jesus searched for you. For some of you, it took months. For others of you, it took years. For others of you, it took decades. But God did not give up on you. He kept searching, and he kept searching until he found you, and you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ. What a beautiful picture of Jesus' persistent search for you and for me. Jesus said this way in Luke 19.10. Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Hey, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're here this morning you've never repented of your sins, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, be assured of one thing this morning. God is searching for you. And God will continue searching until you give your heart and your life to Him. The first parable teaches us of man's condition He's lost. The second parable teaches us the searching of the Savior. He looks and looks until he finds us. The third parable talks about the Father that is patiently waiting. The third parable is the most well-known, arguably the most well-known of all of Jesus' stories. We often refer to this as the parable of the prodigal son. Yet I do not believe that the main character in the story is the prodigal son. No, the story is not about the son. The story is about the father. And the story is about the father that is waiting. Read with me chapter 15 and verse 11. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. 
The younger son told his father, I want to share with you, or I want my share of your estate before you die. So the father agreed to divide his wealth between the sons. Now, often we call this the parable of the prodigal son, and and we think the term prodigal means wayward because the son went off on his own and he was lost for a period of time and then comes back. But the term that is used does not mean wayward. It means the reckless spending of what you have till nothing is left. I submit that this parable is not as much a parable of waywardness as it is a parable of recklessness. This is a parable of, or this parable is a picture of recklessness. Let me show you several things. First of all, we see the reckless request of the younger son. I mean, so many times we jump over this and we don't see. I want you to catch what the younger son says. The younger son tells his dad, I want my share of your estate before you die. He was the younger son. Here's the way an inheritance was divided up. The older son got a double portion. So the older son got two-thirds of the estate. The younger son got one-third of the estate. Now that estate was not generally given until a very significant thing happened. What had to happen for those sons to receive their inheritance? Dad had to die. When dad died, the inheritance was divided, but the younger son was impatient. The younger son loved his inheritance more than he loved his father. So the younger son comes to dad and basically says this, Dad, I love my money more than I do you. Why, dad, I wish you were dead. Give me what is mine. And you talk about a reckless request filled with coldness, filled with uncaring, filled with unconcern. Give me what is mine, Dad. I don't care about you. Your wealth is more important to me than you are. Man, if the story ended there, we'd think, man, what a reckless request. But the father's response is unbelievable. Now, you and I know the story, so it doesn't shock us, but during Jesus' day, the father's response would have been absolutely shocking the father's response would have been reckless you see the father's response is completely out of the ordinary it was unexpected the average middle eastern father whenever the son came in and said dad i love my money more than i love you give me what is mine the dad would have said there's the door hit it quick you're not getting anything that would have been the average middle eastern response but that's not the way this father responded this father gave him his request. It's even more amazing when you realize that the father's assets would, have not, would not have been liquid. They wouldn't have been in cash. They would have been in real estate. And so dad would have had to have done what? Sell property. He would have had to break up his estate. He would have had to tear apart his life to give the son what the son requested. And yet that's exactly what the dad The younger son not only responded with a reckless request, but dad responded with a reckless response. And man, we don't have time this morning. The older brother at the end of the story responded with a reckless attitude. You can study that in verses 25 through 27. And I remind you that this parable was written to the religious Pharisees who were critical of those that they did not feel were worthy of being a part of the inheritance. And Jesus ends the story talking about the reckless older brother who thought he was worthy and criticized the others you see this parable is about recklessness this parable describes a second thing this parable is a picture of redemption I mentioned that this isn't a parable of the prodigal son. It's a parable of the waiting father. You know the story the son takes. Dad mercifully gives one-third of his estate to the boy, and the boy takes it, and the Bible says he goes off to a foreign country. And he spends his inheritance recklessly. Oh, for a couple of weeks, he was the most popular guy on the block. Buying drinks for everybody, man. He was popular, but that money runs out. And the young man soon finds himself broke in a foreign country with no experience, no resume, no job, no family. And he finds himself eating food that wasn't even fit for animals. And one day he looks within himself and says, what in the world 
am I doing? Why, the servants in my dad's house eat better than I do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home, and I'm going to tell my dad, Dad, I don't deserve to be called your son. Let me just be one of your hired hands. Treat me as a servant. Let me live in the house out back. Let me live in the barn. Let me take care of the animals. Dad, just let me come home as a servant. And so the young man starts home. And the text is really clear that even before he reaches home, there's somebody that sees him. Dad. Dad is waiting outside. You say, Brian, what happened? Did dad just happen to go to the mailbox and happen to see, perchance, see the son coming home? No, I believe in the story that that dad loved his son so much that from the very moment that son left, dad was out front waiting for that son to come home. And every day he stood out there thinking, is today the day? Is today the day hoping that his son would come home so he could give his son a second chance? You know the story, that's exactly what takes place. The son comes home and says exactly what he'd practiced. Dad, I don't deserve to be called your son. Dad, treat me as one of your hired servants. Put me in the barn out back. Let me work for a living. Just let me do anything to stay here. And dad's like, you've got to be kidding me. Bring the fatted calf. I'm putting a ring on your finger. My son that was lost has now come home. You see, this parable is a picture of redemption. It's a picture of God giving us what we could never, ever deserve. You see, you are the, para- the prodigal son. I am the prodigal son. God is the father And God embraces us and accepts us, giving us what we could never, ever deserved. Deserve. Aren't you grateful for redemption this morning? Aren't you great? Are you grateful for redemption this morning? That God gives us what we could never ever deserve. The last thing is this parable is a picture of rejoicing. We didn't take the time to look at it, but all three of these parables end the exact same way. Verse 7, when the shepherd went out and found the lost sheep, it says that he put the sheep on his, on his shoulders, went home and threw a party. And then Jesus makes this statement that must have blown the Pharisees away. And he says this, there is joy in the presence of heaven over one sinner that repents. More than over 90 and 9 just people that don't need any repentance. The lady that found the lost coin did what? She celebrated. There was joy. When the prodigal son came home, there was what? There was joy. You see, church, God takes great pleasure when someone who is lost is found. Think with me for just a moment. When God found you. Can you remember that day this morning? Remember that moment for just a moment, for just a second this morning when you were found, when you realized that you were lost, when you realized that you had no hope, and you realized that here was God and his mercy and his grace was reaching out to you, and God granted you what you could never, ever deserve. God gave you a divine pardon, and God gave you forgiveness of sins, and God said, man, no way, Jose, you're a part of my family, and God gave you a redemption story. Whenever you were saved, the Bible says there was rejoicing in heaven. Hey, here's what I want us to catch, church. Reaching lost people rejoices the heart of God. Reaching lost people rejoices the heart of God. We do so many great things at Hollywood Community Church. I love it when we come together. I love hugging on you. I love embracing you. I love the fellowship. I love the worship. I love every part of our church. And I'm sure God sits back as a father and just kind of takes pleasure when his kids get together and and enjoy each other's company. But you know what gives God more pleasure? What gives God more pleasure is when somebody who is lost is found. Here's the challenge. Let's not get so enamored by meeting together that we forget that there's a world right outside these doors that is lost and needs Jesus Christ. 
That's what moves the heart of God. That's what should move us as well. 